turn off all the air or else you have this fantastic whooshing noise in the background. Do, 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 do. So my camera is showing my notebook a little bit cut off. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> on mine I can only see like a little smidge of the notebook, but it looks like on the regular stream it's full screen. So it's good. All right. Hope everyone is ready to design some board games today. Uh, we got some special stuff to play around with, so it's going to be fun. I will sip, sip my coffee here. It's a coffee sort of a day. Mm. It was very kind of dark and gray in Seattle earlier this morning. Uh, very much grilled cheese and tomato soup sort of weather. And now it warmed up, and it is nice and sunny outside. Uh, still coffee, though. I, I like coffee. Coffee's at any time sort of thing. So we got some special stuff today. Uh, I have some bits that I'm going to show off in just a little bit. Uh, but we can get started here with the mind map in just a second. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, my name is Emma Larkins. This is my board game design stream. The idea is I start from a concept, uh, usually just a word that I put at the center of my mind map, and build out there over time. It's a Mind mapping is a technique, brainstorming technique, that's very good at generating a broad, wide range of ideas. For example, I can look at what we did last week here started with the word travel uh, went out from there into plane train scheduling time management uh, souvenirs tourism and eventually came up with a book concept of actually two ideas last week we had uh, traveling the countryside to get souvenirs from different locations and having a competitive element to that we also had an idea of being the person who actually built these sketchy tourist attractions across the country. Uh, yeah, so usually we come up with the design and then do a little bit of prototyping at the end of the stream, either on the design we came up with today or on one of the designs that I'm working on. I'm working on a few things at the moment, so I'm always happy to share my progress on those. Um, so yeah, that is the plan for today. Wonderful Glory, hello, welcome to the stream. Elstra, Elstragoon, I believe, all the days are coffee days. You are a person, presumably human, after my own heart. I agree, every day is a coffee day. Babiscus says, I'm joining you for the second time. Welcome back, Babiscus. Senor Baub, I never got the coffee after dessert thing. I, I think it's a very cultural thing. Thing. Because in certain places, Norway, for example, where my family is from, coffee is, it's an all day sort of thing. Like they have this thing called natmat, which is kind of like fourth meal <laughs> if you're from the US. And after you're partying out all night really late, it's like three or four in the morning, it's still light because it's the north of Norway. Then you have um, another tasty meal of snacks and desserts and you know your energy is flagging so you have coffee there uh coffee after coffee with dessert is also a, a very italian thing um and just the, the flavor i mean just a very nice delicious espresso with dessert the sweet or the the bitter and sweetness there is a very nice combination babiscus says can i give you a mechanical challenge Ooh, i like it yeah sure throw it at me I can't say I'll succeed with it, but I'm always up for a challenge. Also, just to reveal the, the special thing that we have going on today, I got my Haba design kit. For those of you who haven't seen the news on Twitter and elsewhere, every year, or for the last few years at least, Haba has been doing a design challenge where they'll ship you a box of their bits for five bucks. Uh, if you don't know Haba, it's H-A-B-A. It's amazing game company who makes a lot of 
really great, solid, interesting family and kids games, and they're known for just the most amazing bits. Um, so I did want to show off here on my camera some of the bits that I got from the Haba box. I have a little standy human sort of a thing that looks like it can hold some stuff. Uh, I've got stamps. I got a bunch of stamps actually, which is exciting and makes me wonder of like um, someone had talked about roll and write games and like making it a roll and stamp sort of a game. A bunch of dice and stuff. Bobacus mentioned the challenge, so we'll check in on that in just a sec. Um, we also have these bits to play around with. We wanted to see what was up with that. All right. Bobacus says, a game where the players are sort of playing PvE and have asymmetric goals and possibly asymmetric play styles. I'm going to actually copy that down. E. And possibly asymmetric play styles. Cool. Cool. I got that in my notes. Um, I'm gonna keep my little person here because I like them. Asymmetric is tough. I like this. I've been talking a lot recently with different groups of designers about asymmetrism, asymmetrical. Asymmetrism, is that a word? Sure, we'll go with it. As asymmetrical goals, especially things that are assigned to players at the beginning of the game or things that you have to select at the beginning of the game without uh, potentially as a new player without having a lot of information about how the game will play out. Notably, uh, Sidarial Confluence, which I just played a couple of days ago, I really enjoy, but it's a pretty crunchy game. And you start the game by getting a sheet with very small font where you have to read out your whole role. And there's stuff like you're, they're talking about your converters and they're talking about getting colonies. There's a lot of stuff there. You don't know what any of it does. Um, I think Sidarial Confluence makes it work by just throwing so much at you that you have no possible way to know what everything is. So you kind of YOLO a little bit on your character choice. Um, and for that game in particular, it's not just one particular goal that you're going towards as a player that may or may not work with the randomness of the game, with whatever cards come up. Uh, but it's a whole play style. It's a whole um, system, basically. I'm, I'm going to make a note of that, too. It's asymmetrical systems versus just a simple asymmetrical goal. And I think with that, for a very complex game, you kind of have to have a complex game for something like that. What that allows for is a pretty much endless exploration within the game system. Uh, I think you have to be pretty careful with asymmetry, asymmetry, because that's the thing that's what I was looking for. Because a lot of designers do go to that to give their game variety, and the potential downfall of asymmetry is, for example, you're like everyone's trying to get the points from drafting or whatever and maybe your powers let you draft in different ways um but having a and the good part about having an asymmetric goal is it can lead you in a direction especially for your first time playing you might not know exactly what you're supposed to be doing uh so it can give you a direction which is good it can also give you too much of a direction like you might want to do uh different people have different play styles you might want to play more slow or control or you might want to go into combos or you might just want to burn things down really fast using some terminology that magic players will be familiar with uh, but asymmetrical goals can potentially um, thwart some of that emergent gameplay it's a little bit of pros and cons i'm very interested in asymmetry because i'm interested in navigating these things and taking the strong direction of asymmetry and at the same time, letting players have a little bit of flexibility. Else Dragoon says, sounds like Vast. Yes, Vast is, I haven't actually played Vast. I played Root, which is uh, kind of the spiritual successor, I guess. 
I can't compare them too closely because having not played Vast, but from what I've heard of Vast, um, Root takes a lot of those principles and kind of simplifies and streamlines a lot of things. Uh, had a lot of fun playing Root. Uh, and again, I think with this one, when we're talking about goals versus systems, Root is similar to Sidario Confluence in that uh, you have each group or like type of animals, like the birds versus the cats, so on and so forth. You have a whole system of things. You're not just trying to get uh, a different thing from everyone else. You don't have like a special bonus that's different from everyone else, but you're literally everything you're doing in the game is different from what other people are doing. Mm. But this is good. We can start off... Um, so usually what we do is start off the mind mapping and end up going a little more into theme with that. But I'm actually going to start the mind mapping with asymmetry. Think about some different asymmetrical uh, things or concepts and then kind of come back to this and see how they can apply to a game. Bobica says asymmetrical games are also interesting because multiple people can win. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what I meant by PvE. Players are on a clock to win. Mm. And anybody who beats their clock wins. Do, 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 do. Anybody who beats their clock wins. Sweet. I'm going to take down some of these notes so I don't lose them in the chat later on. Do. Yeah, I mean this, the idea of having multiple winners in a game is really cool. I don't know how much everyone's been following the victory points discussion on Twitter. It kind of died down over the last week or so, but for a while, all anyone was talking about was victory points, how we track scoring, how we track winning, and it's really made me think a lot. Um, again, I, I love victory points, a lot of my favorite games are victory point games. But it does make you start to think about what are some things, uh, some things we can do to challenge the established notion of points, of winners. Like the fact that a game has one winner is pretty common for most games. You know, a game that has multiple winners is rare, but super cool, right? Like I, I don't have to be the only winner. I would love to win with multiple people. So I think there's a lot of juicy design space to work with there. Right. <laughs> a, a, asymmetry is one of those words where I always spell it differently and somehow every different spelling is incorrect. Senor Baub says, would you say Dominion develops asymmetry as the game progresses? I would say, I mean, it's a lot of games, it's deck builders especially do that um that's kind of the core of the gameplay loop is depending on the choices you make you are building your own system so i think that, that's a good way that's a good comparison to make there actually now that i think about it because it's not a system that's given to you at the start of the game but you are making choices that change your system and by the end of the game you each person has, I wouldn't say necessarily by the end of the game, because you got a lot of the points cards in there, but if you look at it like three quarters of the way through, each person will have a very different engine, a very different system than everybody else. So um, that's a good point to bring it there. And that does have that nice balance, right, with the asymmetrical is you've made the choices to go into that and then you're kind of locked in and riding on the backs of the choices that you've made along the way. Um, asymmetry, Dominion, and Deck Builders. Building an asymmetric system as you play of being handed the oh and that's another one a good one too that i've been referencing a lot even though i've only played it recently food chain magnet so this one uh you get 
special buffs from a lot of the early actions you take in the game. So if you are the, I think, first to buy a waitress, for example, if you are the first to advertise something, if you're for the first to make a burger, all of these things happen right in the beginning of the game, but you can only do uh, a few of them. But the other cool thing is you have to be the first, but multiple people can get it. So it has this uh, multiplicity thing to it. So are in around everyone in around where the person makes the first burger everyone else who makes a burger which is also the first burger so it's like friendly ties you each get this buff that will help you in the burger strategy going forward so i think that's a very um pushed version of senior bob what you were saying about dominion is you're setting yourself into a strategy but what's very unique uh, about these games is you're not being there's the difference between being kind of handed a, a system and beholden to it and making very early choices in the game that will define your system and kind of oh, grab my water uh, direct your system as you go throughout the game. Mm. Unicorn water. That's good stuff. All right, so we're thinking asymmetry, uh, asymm asymmetry, potentially something that is given to you or something you choose. And I would say there's a very big difference too about choices you make before the game starts versus after, even if it's right after the game starts. So food chain magnet, dominion, etc. You're making choices early in the game, but within the magic circle of the game. You're doing the actions of the game to direct you into one of these asymmetrical directions. Uh, food chain, uh, vast, uh, root, sidereal confluence. These are all games where you get your asymmetry outside of the magic circle before the game starts. So it's a very different experience um, starting from within the context of this asymmetrical role versus kind of building making a couple of choices gameplay choices I guess I would say directing you into a particular role all right asymmetry I'm just gonna make some notes of the games here maybe some of these <laughs> Sidereal Confluence is so long, Con I'll abbreviate it down here, and then Dominion, um, and we'll say FCM down here. So it doesn't have to be just games in here, anything asymmetrical. Um, man, that's, it feels like it's gonna, we're going to have a deep conversation about that. It's like, what's asymmetrical in life? Everything in life is asymmetrical, uh, but we can have some fun, separate but kind of like separate paths that are all equally interesting, I think would be a good direction to go from that. We don't have to come up with a theme, but for this stream in particular, I do like having a theme to springboard off of because talking about the theme and the mechanics together can make it a little more clear and a little more interesting than just talking about uh, kind of dry mechanical stuff. Babka says, Pandemic is a game of PVE. Um, yeah, make that down here. Yeah. Pandemic is a cooperative PvE. I know there's some games, uh, I haven't played it yet, but Dead of Winter is also mostly cooperative. Uh, or we've been talking a lot recently about cooperative, where it's cooperative until it isn't anymore. For Dead of Winter, I believe there is a potential betrayer role that you don't know is in there. Um, betrayal at House on the Hill is another great example where it's PVE, everyone against the haunt, everyone against the house, and then one of the people is potentially the betrayer, or it's a randomized thing, so you're also working together, or multiple people are the betrayers in that game. Uh, so I'll make some notes of that. So we're thinking cooperative elements, and I like this too, we're kind of building something together. 
and even a lot of the competitive games, um, Food Chain Magnet, Sidereal Confluence, like you are, there are very competitive games and it does all come down to points, but there's, uh, you're working together in certain cases, especially Sidereal Confluence is all about negotiating and making deals, so you're cooperating very heavily, even though it uh, ends up being a competitive game. But I can see roles or asymmetry really coming into a building thing, like you're building, building a society, building a planet, or building an intergalactic uh, econ economy, a confluence, I guess, from Sidario. <laughs> an intergalactic thing. As a thing, th different things that you could build together as a group. And there's old fashioned cosmic encounter. Yeah, I went straight to Sidario Confluence. I didn't actually get to play. I watched the video for Cosmic Encounter. I'm even more excited about it now because it's, uh, again, asymmetrical. And there's multiple winners for that too, I believe. So a lot of cool stuff going on there uh, when you're talking about the, the. It's not really. PvE. It's still pretty PvP, but I think it does have multiple winners. Bobakus says, it also makes me think of politicians and business people who work in the same environment but have different goals. Yeah, I'm thinking um, building culture, society, a company, too. For Food Chain Magnet, it was very much uh, you're building a advertising selling behemoth, right? Where you're like advertising stuff, making the stuff, selling the stuff, uh, but building like a startup or a company. Ooh, which makes me think of another game I haven't gotten a chance to play yet. I believe it's called Smartphone Inc. That looks like it has a little bit of that food chain magnet feel to it. <laughs> Every time I say food chain mag magnet, I think I like Magnets, like metal magnets. This is a different thing. This is not what the game is about. Uh, but yeah, the bit, uh, Smartphone Inc. is you're building a smartphone company, I believe, and trying to make the best phone and the best features and kind of competing about that. Uh, startups is another kind of investing, so you're not really building a company. Trying to think of what other company building games there are out there because that's uh, that's a cool concept. I like that. I've been around small businesses and startups long enough to have a very good feel of the vibe of that. Uh, Elstra El Elstragoon says, "Love those betrayer games where it's co-op until it isn't." Doesn't seem like any of these games are easy to do with <laughs> Hobbit bits too. And again, I have the Hobbit bits. You, you see, you say that, um, but that just makes me want to do it more. Just <laughs> an asymmetrical PVE kids game with really nice, cool, chunky bits. Hmm. Uh, like uh, Lemonade Stands. Okay, I gotta look this up now. Because Lemonade is in... <laughs> I have this weird habit where whenever I think of a cool concept for a game that I don't remember seeing myself, I'm like, oh, has that ever been done before? Most of the time they have. It looks like there are actually a few lemonade stands. Um, so I'm going to put the Haba note up here. It looks like there are a few, which again, doesn't mean that you can't make a game. Lemonade stand, kids game. Yeah, which doesn't mean you can't make a game about a theme that's already been done. Like, most themes have already been done. But I always get excited when I see something, uh, the rare times when I think of a theme and I can't find an existing board game for that, then I get really excited. Uh, so I'm like, I'll be the first to do that. And then it just goes on my list, a million list of games that I'm going to finally get done. Building a planet or a company. You start out as co-founders, and everyone does everything. Ooh, I like that. 
Then when someone starts focusing on research and becomes VP of R&D as the company develops. Um, yeah, start out as co-founders doing everything because that is very much how startups work you know everyone you might have some specialization uh, but at the beginning it's really funny actually hanging out with a lot of startup people it's like so what are you in your company it's like well I'm the or nobody's anything you know or like I'm the CEO we're all vice presidents you know we're all vice presidents of something just all equal footing um, have the power to do any task. So have it here some of the things I'm just gonna say tech startup because that like that's most of what startups are. Coding, fundraising, um marketing social media, networking, right? The There's those people who are just always going out to, to events and shaking hands and stuff. And it's like, oh, I coded up our whole app over here. It's like, oh, well, I had dinner with such and such. And they say that, you know, when their startup takes off, then they're going to do this thing someday. And you're like, okay, but I made a thing that we can sell to people. And then someone's like, Oh, I'm actually selling the thing. So there's a lot of kind of tension within there, within the company. Um, so like quick mechanical, you know, you could have cards or actions, maybe like a core, like the core four or five actions that you're going to do. I like this. Some of the things are feeling a little food chain magnety like I was thinking you could start to take the cards and the first person to do like the coding action gets like a special buff so every time they code they they get some more resources or it's a little cheaper to code so it's a very much a food chain magnet thing but I'd love to be able to do this in um, <laughs> a much smaller like lighter easier more accessible package uh, so yeah, like cards or for example, you could have like the bits come back to cool bits like you just there's a supply of like the marketing bits or the coding bits and you just take some of those uh, into your on your turn, you know, you take a, a bit as opposed to a card. And for the first ones for the cheap like a basic code card or something. You just take that into your supply. I will say one that's one thing about food chain magnet. Like altogether, it's a pretty crunchy system, but on the turns, the individual things you can do are pretty straightforward. So if you play every turn, you lay out your structure, your hiring structure for how many people, uh, or your management structure for how many employees you have out in a turn, how many actions you can take, and the first one you get is just hire. So you just take one of the base level cards and that goes into your supply so the ease of kind of taking cards into your system is, is a pretty cool thing from that game uh <laughs> senior oh my gosh activity tracker mogul i don't know what that means but i like it <laughs> oh yeah we're all um I'm actually going to type this out. We're all secretly tracking how much work we're doing. So that we can argue for a bigger slice of the pie for more shares. So again, you're talking about having multiple people winning. So if two people have the same percentage, like the same chunk of the company, then like everyone with the most stock shares at the end of the game 
wins, uh, but people can, they all start out with even ones. So if they don't budge those uh, out with even shares of stock, they don't budge those at all, by the end of the game, everybody will win, but you're trying to nudge and bump yours so you get a bigger piece of the pie, right? There could also be a side goal for <laughs> having an actual successful company. Um, side goal, your company doesn't fail. I don't know if that's actually a good mechanic or not, but that would be funny to have that as a thing where uh, if your company fails, everyone loses. Company fails. Everyone. Bobica says, any game about growing anything has already been done in an idle game. Yeah, I mean, that that's an excellent point. Like, eggs, cookies, walking, dungeon crawling. Yeah, they've all been done. Doesn't mean that you can't come back and do them. Else Dragoon says, theme, social science fair projects. Ooh, I like that too. Um, oh... See, and this is actually, this is great. I'm more than happy to have two directions. Like, usually multiple games, uh, multiple games will come out of one brainstorm section, session, which is awesome. Um, uh, shared, I'll say shared social science, uh, yeah, shared science project um, team. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Team science project, uh, team project in school. You see, this is cool because it could go either way. Uh, branching off of ideas here. If you're going in the company direction, you could be building a company together, working on who's going to have the biggest share. Uh, but if you're talking a school direction, and that could potentially be even a, a lighter family style game and something that kids can very much. Um, associate with and understand the emotions that go into this because oh, we've all had those experiences of working on a science project or any sort of a project as a team um, you all start out doing stuff then people slack off uh, get points for most credit and most slacking, or you could even have additional asymmetric goals where maybe you want to be the slacker, or you want to be the hard worker, and somehow you're tracking these different things over time, where it's like you do the least number of actions, but you're still getting maximum credit for, uh, for the work that you put into it. Um, yeah, and then depending on, like, you know, you, you're the teacher's pet or something, you have the meeting with the teacher, and then you get more credit for the project. Uh, there's definitely some fun stuff going on there. Star Wars, Senior Baob says, Star Wars bounty hunters are the E, and the bounty is the P. So the players are the bounty? <laughs> And the hunters are the ones that are coming after them. Or are you the the hunters? Whatever's I like the bounty hunting thing. Either you are the hunters or the bounty. Uh, Bobby says, what if it's cooperative in that everyone isn't trying to have the company go under, but they want to maximize their shares, salaries, fiefdoms? Um, yeah. I make, make sure that your company doesn't go under. So you're going to have events come up, um... You might have uh, triggers to manage, like your money goes too negative, um, like you check your, 
take your net worth, we'll say. Net worth after X rounds, if it's too low, if you can't pay salaries, then you all lose. Yeah. Uh, I like that that's the cooperative element of the game. Is there some baseline here? Or you mentioned, like, if it's the shares, salaries, uh, they're maximizing their stuff, but there is something that you're checking. So if, you know, particular people are trying to work on different things to get their credit to go up, and you might say, like, oh, if I'm out there, it, for potentially realistic, you know, like, if I'm out there networking, my visibility becomes really high. Um, and so people are seeing me as being worth more to the company, but again, I'm not necessarily bringing in money, not necessarily making our product that we're going to be able to sell. So there's a really cool, interesting balance there. Um, yeah, sample. Ne networking increases your shares, but doesn't bring in money. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, I like the, the quad, because that's a very easy baseline to see. You know, if every turn you're like, oh, if our money tracker goes below this point, we don't knock it back up. Ooh, yeah, that reminds me of like a Twilight Struggle or uh, 13 Days, which is the version of that type of gameplay that I've played. Uh, you're playing the cards, if at any point you knock everything into nuclear war, then everyone loses, right? So it's a very nice tension in the game, especially when one that encourages um, no one person to push things too far. Uh. <laughs> Activity tracker equals Fitbit, but my take on it is interesting. So would you play as the Fitbit? Hmm. Yeah, there's some cool stuff there. Bobakus says, maybe instead of straight winning, you get tiers of victory for how wealthy you become, which you can increase by getting a bigger slice or by growing the company. So straight winning, you get tiers of victory for how wealthy you become. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That one... <laughs> it reminds me of a purely cooperative game. Uh, like, Just One. Just One is a great example of that, where there's... You can't really... You're playing all this pure cooperative. You can't really win or lose, but depending on the number of things you get right, they actually have a breakdown in the rules for how successful you've been uh with the highest level being like you probably cheated if you <laughs> either you are psychic with the rest of the people in your group or you cheated to get to this level so there's some fun flavor that you can put into there uh tears of victory <laughs> So just winning, you win more, win more. So you could say, um, tears of victory, uh, your wealth is a function of the size of the company and your portion of it. And that can be interesting. And that's, uh, again, not really victory points because you're just tracking your pure, your finances here. Uh, very easy to track. You know, this is how much the company is worth. This is the portion of that that I have. And then at the end of the game, considering that the game hasn't, uh, that your company hasn't completely fallen apart, uh, you track everyone's winnings based on, like, super billionaire, or can buy a planet, or have a lot of fun, cool flavor in there. 
I also like this, like, pushing it a little bit away from some of the tighter, more strategic economic games, making it more real startup-y, right? Like, put, put some, like, crazy push-the-boundaries sort of events in there, like um, dot-com crash. Uh, I'm going to make a little events list. Put crazy events in there to up the drama of the game. Not as much a dry euro economic. Uh, so like a dot com crash or um, like a tech boom or different font. Like <laughs> all of a sudden X product becomes super popular and can you pivot into those products and all of a sudden you just make a billion dollars, maybe the game runs like the game is over because you cross the threshold of most money ever made. Um, yeah, some fun stuff there. Hanabi is also a pure cooperative tiered victory game. Um, Hanabi comes up all the time. I really need to play that game just to, or at least look up the rules. Tiered victory, because I like this, the, the tiered victory, and I think it can be friendlier than something that's like one winner, rest of the people losers. Like, you can't always look and say, like, who got more points. Like, everything, every victory is by nature tiered, but it doesn't feel that way. Although, I guess that's a question, you know, if you do put the tiers in there, Will people naturally think of it as a winner and losers or not? You know, it's an interesting thing to test, and that's something that you can really find out in a play test, right? Put this in front of some humans and see what the reaction, if they're like, oh, well, that person just won, or if they can get into the spirit of everyone who wins. Or like my other game, and then we died, everyone loses, everyone dies, or you win when everyone dies. You win together, so it's weird. Uh, can people get into the spirit of everyone wins? Uh, Bogus says, and this is starting to get crunchy, but there could be a separate investing track that encourages you to sell your shares and put it into the stock market if you don't believe the company's future. Say you pulled a bad hand and other players can buy. Say they pulled a good hand. Ugh. I mean, like, I find all this economic uh, stock market stuff really fascinating. So I think, I think that could be fun. I think, as with most things, I think there's a way that you can do it that makes it feel very natural. And I mean, there's a way you can do it where it's very thinky and you're trying to crunch the numbers on it. Uh, but, uh, again, with startups, just taking the cards, putting them into the market, um, like having your cards in your hand or choosing when to put them in front of you, each card is one unit of ownership of that stock. So if you're getting each card is one stock and then you're selling them, aka trading them in for other things, for money or whatever it is that you have in the game, for other actions, and those cards become available in a pool, and again... Um, for the next round of investments, you know, you put more cards into the center there. And I think it's something, like, I love this um, bidding or betting based on how good or bad your hand is. <clears throat> and when you say hand like that, it makes me think of, like, a shared deck or a deck builder, shared deck builder, maybe, that you're all working on together. But being able to tune that, because that's always a thing in a game, right? Like. I get a bad hand, I kind of have to deal with it now, but if you can sell or buy stocks based on what you got in the hand, um, that could be something really fun to play around with. Senior Bob says, I'm at the theme of starting up an activity tracker company. <laughs> I need to be less concise. Um, yeah. Yeah, for, for like a tech hardware company. Uh, 
um, or like a data tracking company. I guess, <laughs> honestly, you get very meta here. An activity tracker company is technically a data tracking company, right? Because they're getting that data from all these people. And I imagine that they are using that data for stuff. Um, I mean, this is a whole, a whole interesting thing to think about too for the game, like for what kind of company you're starting and building. Is it going to be, are you gonna have options? Or is it just one type of company? So for something like Smartphone Inc., right, it's all about a very specific type of tech. Um, or is it going to be something as specific as like activity trackers, apps, smartphones, uh, Etc. Or is it going to be more general, like a tech company, food company, hospitality, entertainment, and just use the broad strokes to outline the company? Or is it going to be just one thing? Because um, that definitely leans towards accessibility. Like, do you have to choose what company? And that's <laughs> that's it. A whole other question. Do you have to choose what kind of company it is before you start? Because if you start off like it is this kind of a game, right? Like this is a tech company building game or, you know, like <laughs> make some crazy uh, amalgamation of all the tech company games. Like the game could be called uh, a Moogle, a Moo, a Moo Soft, <laughs> a Moo Soft. Oh my gosh, a Moo, a Moog Soft. <laughs> totally non-infringing tech company name, or like I kind of like the idea of this whole thing about startups pivoting, like maybe just the play of the game is you're, you're doing actions and then like a tech company, the coding action makes more sense, but instead of coding, it could be uh, men making product. <laughs> so I'm going to make the product this round and that could be anything from cupcakes, to computers, to um, a social network. And that could be interesting too, like depending on the cards that come up, it's like, oh, we're a cupcake company. And then we pivot into being a waste removal company. And that could be fun to have all sorts of different junctures. And maybe there's like a five archetypes in there. Uh, the nice thing about the pivoting is it creates a little bit of tension. Oops. Yeah. Pivoting creates tension amongst the co-founders. So maybe one player will have a very strong initiative to go into one type of company and somebody really want to go into another type of a company. So like little things in there where you might have the option to change what your company is doing could make for a lot of interesting gameplay. Else Dragoon says there's a sweet.com crash boom card game called burn rate. Basically just about trying to run out of money last by keeping your burn rate low. Is this new? Uh, that sounds super cool. Burn rate game. <laughs> I love how everyone's, everything is just on board game. Oh, 2002. Ooh, interesting. This might actually be uh, a little tricky to get your hands on, but that's definitely worth 
checking that out. Uh, I love that. There's the other game. I'm not going to remember what, what the name of it is. Um, you play as people, uh, descendants who received a fortune from your late relative who passed away, and you have to spend the money the most frivolously. <laughs> so whoever spends all their money and is very frivolous about it and uh, very obvious about how they're spending their wealth is becomes the winner of it. Hopefully someone remembers what that that's called because I don't remember the name of that game. That sounds a very similar thing to that. Uh, the thing I want to check out, I don't even know from 2002 if it would be possible to find this game, but it very much looks like something within the sphere of what we're doing here. Okay, so I like this. I definitely like where this is going. Bobicus, uh, I hope that this is uh, fulfilling the challenge you issued at the beginning of the stream where we're starting to look at some PvE types of games, certain things with um, multiple winners potentially in a game and where it is very cooperative, where there's potentially a lose condition where everyone can lose together, but some people win more than other people. Because uh, I'm very excited about this concept. A little more mechanically, they're talking about startups. Again, ideally, at least for the start, I'm, I'm okay if things get crunchier over time. I like to try and develop core gameplay loops that are pretty simple in of themselves and then build out from there if you need a little bit more complexity. Um, if you have maybe different face down decks, I'm thinking five for now, um, and produce very core basic actions here like produce and producing would be making the stuff of the company, whether that's cupcakes, code, so on and so forth. Marketing, which would be somehow um, modifying a perceived value, sure. Perceived value of your stuff. Uh, fundraising slash networking, I think I might say. And this doesn't increase the stuff you have to sell or the value of the stuff you have to sell. Uh, actually, marketing could also be increased stock price. Because if you market things, people perceive them as more valuable, then your company stock goes up, maybe. Still have to think a lot on how to separate out these different things. Fundraising, networking, you don't make more stuff, you don't increase the value, but maybe uh, you just get more money. Uh, maybe fundraising, get more money. <laughs> so you bring in money, but you lose stocks. Uh, lose stock. So the stock pool goes down. Uh, and we had said through different fundraising rounds how you would increase the stock pool. Uh, again, more stock is good because people can shift the percentage of the stocks that they have. But of course, when there's more stock to distribute, the stock you have now goes down in uh, re relative value. Um, fundraising, get money. <laughs> Oh, and I, I like that too, where individuals are making these choices, right? Like, I'm going to go fundraise. Like, you might negotiate a little bit in there. We said, I'm going to fundraise. We're going to lose this stock and then get more money because otherwise our company is going to fall apart. Um, and I was thinking about doing, like, the networking... And again, I say this 
Like, I love this theme for a game because this is a world that I spent a lot of time in. I'm still very close to it as well. And there's definitely this activity in the tech startup world, uh, especially in New York City, where I was for a long time, where you're going out and you're going to events, you're going to the right parties, you're making sure that you're very visible. Doesn't bring you money, doesn't produce anything, doesn't increase the value of anything. Uh, but we'll say that it's like a tech slash filtering thing. So mechanically in the game, the networking would do, would give you a lot of uh, strategic options. So this would be maybe networking strategizing. <laughs> Again, five different types of things is totally arbitrary. I like starting with threes and fives because they're very, or threes, fours, and fives are very fun, comfortable numbers for people. Uh, like five cards in hand is just so known that I've tried doing different numbers of cards in hand and people, it's made me uncomfortable. <laughs> it's made people uncomfortable. Uh, you can do it if you have a strong enough mechanical reason, but starting out with some of these known um, numbers is a good place to start. Uh, let me check back in with the chat here. Last will. Oh my gosh, is that it? Of course, Senior Bob, you know all this stuff. Last will game. Um, if I see the picture of it, I'll definitely... Or if I see the back of the box? Yeah! Oh my gosh, that's it. Yes. Thank you, Senior Bob. I was going to be sad about that. I'm going to post it in here because this is a cool thing to see. Absolutely is. Elstragoon says, I'll bring it on Wednesday. Oh my gosh. Awesome. I'm excited. Sales and marketing. What does our... Oh, yes. Uh, research and development, of course. Um, oh, no. Research and development is a huge part of it. It doesn't really exist. Sales is the fifth leg. And sales isn't just sales. It's also buying vendors to help you produce your product. So I think that, um, cause marketing and sales are obviously different things. Sales, like R and D I like, um, I'm going to pull this down here. Hopefully this is legible. I like R and D also maybe, a, a tech filtering thing. Um, yeah, we're going to say R&D and strategy. I like this fifth category of networking. So I had said that maybe this is like the filtering one. Um, cause the whole thing, like R&D is you're like strategizing, you're moving things around, you're setting things up very sy systematically, smartly, intelligently. And then networking is the, uh, YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> networking is the YOLO activity where you're going to have some players who absolutely just love this feeling, this idea of, I'm just going to go out there and schmooze and have some fun. They're the, uh, the grasshopper, right, in, the, in that fable. The fable of the ant versus the grasshopper. So like, I was just out all night partying and schmoozing, you're welcome. And everyone else in the company is like, you're ruining this company, we want to kick you out. But then that one in a million chance where you end up on um, like Shark Tank or whatever because this person just happened to schmooze. So you get like special power cards. Uh, that are very um, dependent very precise, special situation. Cards. Yeah, R&D is super, I mean, R&D is most of what startups do. So especially producing versus research and development, producing would be, I made our app, right? I made our app, it's on the app store, everything that goes into having the product available for sale. Research and development, you're working on the product, but the separating it out would be 
like we're testing some new stuff. It might not end up in the final thing. We might be testing cupcake flavors. It's expensive. It's expensive, you know, for this game in particular, you're taking whole turns, whole actions to do this research and development. Uh, it might not go anywhere, so it's a high risk. Like I would say the same for the networking strategy, very high risk, high reward. R&D is not quite as high risk because ideally you get better at it over time and you kind of know what you're doing. Um, but there's some element of like trying things out, moving things around. And now Babacus, you had mentioned the, the idea of sales as well. Also very, very important, and I think, honestly, one of the hardest things to do, and the reason a lot of startups fail, um, and something that <laughs> very few people can do easily and naturally is the sales part of it, that being sales, actually transmitting money for goods. Um, and I could see like marketing here being about perceived value. So like fundraising could bring in money, but you lose stock sales. Um, we could say, well, producing costs money. So if we're looking how these things are broken down, most things costs, cost money. Fundraising costs stocks. Sales costs a product. Yeah. So I can type this out over here. Because we're looking at we're looking at this as an economic game. So on the one side we're gonna have this what everything costs, and on the other side, what everything uh, nets. So outgo input for the different things. So sales, costs, product, um, earns, that's what we say, earns, money. So you can only do sales if someone has been producing things, so you're reliant on a lot of these different aspects, but you're literally bringing money into the company, which can be very important. Production, costs, money, earns, product. So it's kind of like the reverse of sales, marketing, costs, money. All these things cost time too. I don't know if I really want to worry about that too much, but um, earns valuation. So this makes the whole, um, like you don't have any more money, but the valuation of your whole company will go up. And you need the valuation of your company to be high, not actually the value. <laughs> There's definitely an interesting contrast there. All right, fundraising, um, costs, stock. So this you have a limited pool of stock, right? And you get, earns you money. Networking, costs money. I don't know. I'm not sure there. Earns <laughs> question mark future favors. So this is a little bit of the YOLO one here. Uh, and last we have research and development cost money obviously uh, earns strategy um, manipulation. Uh, flexibility. We'll put that in there. Sales isn't just sales, buying the vendors. Senior Baub says, don't forget about patents. And Babaka says, maybe networking doesn't cost money. Um, yeah, patents would definitely be in the 
patents, uh, future leverage, and power. Um, yeah, we're thinking cost time. Maybe just put time in here. Cause it's not like that a lot of times networking, you know, it's kind of on you or whatever. You get invited to a free party. Like you're going a lot of, it's time, maybe money. I mean, a lot of it can be, uh, or costs wild card. So maybe with this networking, you're giving someone stock, right? You just like give some random person a stock certificate. You spend some money to go to a convention. Um, cost anything. Yeah. I, <laughs> this is a very me thing too, from a design perspective. Like, I, I swear, the beginning of every one of my designs, I always want to throw something in there that's just like, here's the YOLO option. Here's the, the wild card thing um that some people are gonna really enjoy and other people are gonna be mad but not like really mad just kind of like fake annoyed because it messes with their finely tuned plans uh senior bob says also supply chain delivery of product which may be nothing if you're just producing software etc i think um managerial maintenance that's what i wanted to say maintenance uh that's a good point senior bulb something in here and this is a question like how realistic do you want to get versus is the thing fun or not um maintenance could be the events the upkeep instead of necessarily being a thing that you do. Ooh, or I like the, the pass option. I like maintenance as a thing necessarily, like most of the time you're gonna be doing one of these like cool epic things, but sometimes you might need to recoup or take a time, um, take some, take a turn off uh, to be able to consolidate. Um, and like maintenance, might cost a little money, uh, might cost nothing and earn nothing. So the idea, like there is maintenance from like supply chains replying to emails, like all the boring stuff of a company, but it still has to get done. So that's an interesting thing too, where if you go enough turns and nobody does maintenance, then you have some sort of catastrophe. Maintenance, you have a catastrophe. Catastrophe. I like that as maybe, maybe it's the game timer as well. And that's an interesting negotiation too, where you're like, who's gonna take a turn off to do the maintenance of the company? And maybe somebody does maintenance every turn. Again, we had talked about hidden goals in the beginning where maybe you, get extra points for keeping your head down or whatever. Um, it, it's funny too, right? Something that on the face of it seems kind of boring and uninteresting could be made to be an interesting part of the game. Uh, Bogget says earns company connections, which can be used to boost other sectors. Like you network with a vendor and get cheaper product. Okay. For the networking. I like that. Um, Yeah, I've been thinking about it as a little bit more of a wild card thing, but maybe the research and development is more of the wild card thing, and this is a um, modifiers 
earns modifiers that help with everything else. Yeah, I like that. Uh, networking can earn favor points that earn favor points that can be spent to help other players. Maybe, so that's kind of a combination of both of those things. Like you have modifiers for other things and the, I don't know, wait, this is future favors. Hmm. Okay, I'm not sure whether I want this to go in research and development or in networking. I'll have to think about that a little bit, but I like both. Uh, so you're getting these tokens to say like, oh, you can do that for a little bit cheaper. You can, doing sales, you can make a little bit more money that way. You can lose a little less stock if you're doing fundraising. Uh, and maybe they're generic favors too, like they don't have a name on them. So different people can be jockeying for your favor as the networker. Um. <laughs> Oh man, and I like that too, like, all of these are going to have, depending on which actions you're taking, it's going to affect your portion of stock. So as a player, I think you'll earn and lose stock. You'll earn and lose stock based on the actions you take. Networking could earn less stocks everyone's like oh you're just off schmoo schmoozing obviously you're not you're not doing anything for the company but then you can uh barter your favors with other players for more stock so i like these again negotiation things it's turning into a scenario confluence, right? Because I had so much fun playing that game and my fellow designers and I have been talking a lot about how to work those ideas more into games. So a lot of fun stuff there. Babaka says, I think for networking, it's going to be more specific and less abstract. So how does one become the finance guy rather than the marketing guy? What makes networking wild cardish is you don't know what favor you're, you're going to get um power maybe networking and research and development could be could be similar to networking uh, networking has random favors uh, R&D has specific things, specific favors or boosts. So the slight differentiation there. And again, it might not be enough of it. I like having both flavor wise. Uh, it might not be enough of a distinguishing factor to have the two in there, but I like the idea of research and development being a little more directed uh, you kind of know what you're going after. Um, I like negotiation too. Like you have the wild card favors. So you don't know how much you're going to pay off. Whereas research and development could be specific things like maybe a tech tree or something that you're working into. Uh, ex exi <laughs> Exionis. I hope that's the correct pronunciation there. Hello. Fundraising would be PR then. Yeah. Uh, fundraising slash PR. Bobkiss. Oh, actually, I like what you just said better. Networking has random favors that pays off immediately. But um, tech tree. Research and development tech tree pays off over time. Yeah, because we had talked about the networking and it being like, oh, I network now and maybe sometime in the future something happens. But I like separating out those two things as concepts into 
uh, research, because research and development does take a lot of time, and you don't know exactly what the payoff is going to be. You kind of have to just do this stuff, um, hoping that if you do it enough, it will pay off. Whereas networking very much can be like, hey, you know, I'm going to get you on this show, on this talk show, and then it's really going to boost the image of your company. Um, so there can be some fun stuff going on there. Networking is this industry's equivalent of human resources. <laughs> mm. I like it. Cool. <laughs> All right, so we talked about, and again with these cards, it could be uh, random decks of cards. with maybe some deck manipulation could be a possible power to have a little bit more control over what you're getting from the decks. So the randomness versus, for example, food chain magnet very much has a tech tree and you can choose exactly where to buy into that. Um, I kind of like the idea of this one. What do we have? We had, oh, the maintenance one was the seventh one. Out here. <laughs> I like the game, like the simplification of it just being the seven decks and based on the cards uh, being the stuff that you can do. And then either having it be deck buildery or just hand management. Like if we keep it a fairly simple game, you're just taking one card per turn and trying to figure out exactly when to use those cards, it could be a situation where you're keeping those all in your hand or just go straight food chain magnet where each round you're choosing you have some limitation for how many you can put face up and activate um, so you have like the actual the taking you're committing to one of these seven parts of your startup maybe an activation phase because uh, some of this and it could get more complex with the different powers that are on the cards but there's a lot of games of this style that get really heavy and have a lot of stuff going on and there would be a fair amount of stuff going on uh, if you're also keeping like a value valuation track so you have your two three four five six seven uh, you know, you like your bank over here. Uh, tr 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 have your stock pool. Uh, valuation tracker. Uh, where you're keeping track of company value. and then company money. And you'd be checking to see if you were running out of money or if your valuation got too low, then your company would fold. Um, I like this tracker. I also like the idea of an app tracker. Cause I'm trying to think of a way, depending on the number of stocks you have, like you could do math and have it be so, like the company's valued at $10 million, each person has two, stocks <laughs> um and there's five players so each of them has equal number each of them has a fifth so that's two million each right so you could you had some sort of app or system to make it really easy to track and see what your valuation would be that would be a nice addition to the game babagus says i like the idea of losing or gaining stock being strictly a matter of player negotiation yeah Player negotiation, I think, yeah, it could be that. Like, I was thinking certain things would redistribute stocks, uh, like certain base activities, uh, like depending on if you did production, maybe you get one stock. Uh, 
if you do sales, you get one stock. If you do networking, you lose one stock. But yeah, if it's going more into a pure negotiation thing, that could be interesting as well. Uh, getting and losing stock. Either pure negotiation or a set number gained or lost for the action you choose to do. And of course the stock runs out, right? At a certain point, because it can become more valuable, you have your stock pool that you're distributing over time, and then you have to do, um, and probably you would have to agree to do that. You have to do a new round of fundraising to add more stock to the pool. And you can only do that so many times. You only do that like one or two times before people aren't interested in diluting the stock pool anymore. Exionis says having amount of stock and how much each stock is worth are different things. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's why either like a system or app or something to be tracking those things could be very useful because the, the core idea here is like having a valuation tracker um, and this is just like a share you move your token along the track uh, so if you have an app it will do it all automatically but if you don't you could have tracker of like total valuation and this will move up and down during the round and the, the uh, end of the round you could manually check everyone's stock and then do the math to figure out and just have the tracker here move everyone's tokens to track their individual valuation individual valuation and their valuation would be a function of total valuation divided by their stock percentage. <laughs> oh, and this is a good, uh, <laughs> yeah, this maybe gets a little fiddly, but you have to, when you sell the stock for fundraising to get more money, the stock doesn't go away. That's a big pot of, part of the pie. So you have each player's counters. Um, Calculating the how much value stock has function of total value divided by your percentage have to have to factor in investors portion as well. So that's the thing about tracking it too, which would make it interesting because you're sure you're selling a bunch of stock. Like one of your players just keeps doing the fundraising action and selling off all your stock. You have some money for now. Um, but you, each time you do that, every person's valuation goes down. So it's definitely a thing to consider there. Valuation tracks, maybe the money is like another tracker yeah i mean i just drew i was thinking monopoly bank here with the actual cash dollars uh but the bank could be just a pure money tracker and that's got something kind of nice too for this sort of a game right if you don't have like individuals don't have to worry about money it's all company-based money so you could just use a money tracker instead of fiddling with money in the bank. So that's actually a cool idea. I like that. So if your valuation is at four, fundraising adds four to your money. Yeah. And then there would have to be a company maintenance tracker, how much money your company spends per turn. Um, yeah, I, I think for the money tracker, that could just be income and outgoing. So every round you have... Uh, the raising phase, 
and then the cost fees, right? So at the beginning, you're at X or whatever, and then it will go up over time. And then at the end of it, you'll calculate out your costs. So you can track everything, the money on this track. And then valuation is separate from money. Like, I don't think valuation could, that's a good question. Because your valuation can be, like, not at all related to how much money you could have. You could have tons of money, but not be very high valued. Uh, does money factor into your valuation? That's a good question. Maybe. I'll have to think about that. Sonia says, what are winning conditions then? Can you win by selling your 60% packet? Uh, yeah, Sonia, we had talked in the beginning about it being a tiered victory thing. So if your company folds, everyone loses. So if there's the PVE cooperative element to it, we're all working together um, and trying to all win win victory, but then some people having more points than others, and then your valuation at the end of the game will be your tiered victory percentage there. Babakis says, yeah, you win based on your wealth at the end of the game. Yeah, there's still, and that's the question too, like the tiered, multiple tiered victories there. Like we'll all win together, we can't all lose the game. We still all win because our company succeeded, and then we're checking our tiered thing. So there's a subtle distinction there, right? So he says, imagine another player bought 30% of your company and gets a member of the board or earn, like, regular stock. You could win by making all companies worthy and having shares in each. Okay. Uh, Babaka's valuation of money completely separate. Excellent. Glad we're on the same page for that. Yeah, so for this one, I mean, <laughs> that's the expansion, right? That's the next level with having the... A bunch of, like, everybody having multiple companies and investing in different things. You did mention board members, though. Uh, could be a card, an event, or maybe in the networking deck. Networking, yeah. So, so far we're looking at having a money tracker, valuation tracker, um, player functions. And then it's funny, I was talking with my husband about events the other day, and he was saying that he's really not a fan of events because you can't really prepare for them. But I think in this one, in this game, it could be interesting to have an event, and maybe they're a triggered thing based on cards that you play than necessarily something that just comes out over time. But I like the randomness of maybe having some of that in there as well. If you're competing in one company, then you need to add gossip, blackmail, and other drama. <laughs> oh my gosh, Exonius, you're speaking my language. Uh, I love that. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Gossip. Yeah, I'm gonna copy that down. Boop. Mm, paste without formatting. And, and that's, I mean, that's where the pure negotiation thing comes down like your a lot of the those feelings and emotions will come out during the negotiation phases um but that could also be phases. could also be in some of the decks drama cards. Because that's one of the cool things, I say cool, one of the interesting things about tech startups and really a lot of industries where you have this bust or boom mentality. Uh, there's, especially when you're, you're talking about the networking, the relationships built in there, there is a lot of relationship stuff and a lot of potential drama and certain vendors like being really good to work with or certain vendors being blacklisted. Um, 
Yeah, having blackmailing, having the power to do a secret negotiation. Ah. Uh, or blacklist someone else's action. Uh, drama cards could be in networking. That feels like a networky sort of a thing. <laughs> networking slash hobnobbing um research and development or maybe in maintenance mm. could be na networking or maintenance because the maintenance we had said doesn't really cost anything doesn't really earn anything could potentially be sort of a boring action but maybe as part of that, like that's where all the drama is, right? Like you're checking the company emails and that's when you find out that someone's been like having vacations on the company's dime or something like that. That could be a fun thing to add in there like that. Events, new law, yeah. Uh, this is good. I'm gonna copy down the events thing. Stock exchange crashes, something like your Bitcoin wallet getting hacked. And again, people definitely have mixed feelings about the whole events thing. If you add too much randomness to a game, it can feel like you're really not controlling things. Um, but again, we had talked about in the same way, like we talked at the beginning of the stream, how giving asymmetrical goals at the beginning of the game can really push someone in a direction and, and potentially limit choices. So I think a good type or a good way to use events, random events in a board game is to push people into a direction and give them some of the ideas. So for example, if uh, valuation, like your valuation goes below zero, you all lose the game together. And the random event is, hey, this tanks the valuation. Then over the next round, everyone's gonna have to really work towards um, increasing the valuation of the company. So having events as shared, especially because it is kind of contentious, I feel like a lot of this game is going to be pushing people to go into different directions. Having events as shared goals can pull people back in, uh, especially because if you're playing the game optimally, you know, your, your company shouldn't be tanking. So an event can really pull people together. Together. good ones will help to direct the actions of the game. <laughs> Gain gossip during networking. Um, yeah. Where did I put this? be in network or main maintenance game gossip during networking corporate corporate espionage yeah heck yeah um i love that as a networking or as an event maintenance higher upkeep but higher morale. Um, higher upkeep. Higher morale. Morale as a uh, cost or factor. I think morale is a very important thing. Like that's if your morale goes to zero, then your company also folds. Even if you're doing okay as a company, but you just fall apart socially and emotionally, then that's definitely a potential failure point for the, the company. Um, you, Exonius, mentioned paying workers for coffee. 
Um, let me bullet point this so it's a little... Yeah, there we go. Paying workers for coffee, free dry cleaning, free food, uh, morale maintenance. There's a lot of good stuff to put in there. I'm trying to imagine how exchanges of stock between players go. What does the stock seller get in return? Um, yeah, there would be, there, there'd be different actions that different people were trying to do. And as part of this, like I had said, the stock would be coming from the pool. Maybe if it wasn't coming from the pool, you would have to do an exchange between players. So for certain things, like if you were making production, you would earn a stock. Uh, if there's no more stock in the pool, maybe you would have to get that from another player. But the things you could give them... Um, be cards, like future deals for things to do. We had mentioned some of these favor tokens that you could use to do more powerful effects in the future. Zoni says money, maybe they want to switch stocks to another company or need to sell because you don't have enough for the upkeep phase. Yeah. I like the idea of getting stock tokens of other companies. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, maintenance. Fix my spelling. Stock tokens of other companies. Could be another resource. Require a lot of tokens on all sides. If say a company stock was worth 1.2 times what your stock was. Yeah, there, there would be some tracking there. I think, again, putting potentially a digital element to this could very much change up the, the shape of the game. Uh, I don't like to worry too much about how many tokens or production of a game is going to be because I want to figure out if it works and then make it work for the most fun style of the game. Can you get caught in blackmail? Uh, probably. If it sounds fun, then yeah. Yeah, put it in there. Actually, it only requires one side of the exchange to have numerous tokens and keep the values around five to one or 10 to one. There's a lot of stuff math wise you can do to make sure that it's not as complicated. <laughs> and of course, add the tracker. Um, yeah, I mean, you're talking about tokens, but, and I'm making, I'm drawing these out as separate trackers. Uh, stock for other company. And these could be separate ones that you can move around or you could have a whole whole board that was just full up with trackers. Uh, hopefully find a attractive way to present that because that could be a little boring looking. Uh, but you could fancy it up so it was appealing to the eye. <laughs> you never <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Baba Kiss, yeah. Can never have too many trackers, right? Just throw a tracker on it. That's great. Spontaneous finance finance audits. Um where's my events here? Man, I gotta break out a separate thing. I think we did events earlier, but I gotta I wanna put this one down. Uh spontaneous finance audit. Uh, if money is below X, punishment. <laughs> so you would have, um, ooh, or you lose the game. That's dramatic, right? Like, oh, you know, we can't bottom out. We can't go below zero or lose the game. Then finance audits like, JK, you can't go below one million. And you're like, no. So you always have to be like balancing stuff. You can say that card could come up that would lose us the game unless we bump up and have some kind of juicy negotiation going on there. 
Sionius says, imagine espionage. Ooh, yeah, for the corporate espionage. Imagine espionage allows you to check next event. If that event is all stocks lose half value, you would sell fast. Um, yeah. Espionage and other cards that can tune or, um, modify the events deck. See events deck, uh, you could gain these cards from networking or research and development. And that's the thing about having an events deck too. If you don't have any control over it, it can be a little bit stressful just to have random stuff coming up, but you can put more powers into the other cards and decks to modulate that a little bit, right? So if you do have, uh, you know, you do have a research and development for like the singularity card. <laughs> singularity. Um, so if you research the coming together of all artificial intelligence, then uh, a certain event gets tutored to the top of the deck, right? Like there could be a all humans and robots live together in harmony or like the all robots try and take over the world event, whatever it's going to be. But there could be some uh, ordering of that event stack that could be really interesting. Mm. Yeah, I like the, the espionage as modifying the, the event stack. I think that's a cool thing. But other players wouldn't know. You could bluff. Ooh. Um, C event stack. So there's like the tutoring ones. Um, asymmetrical game state knowledge. Only one person gets to look at top of deck or put a certain card on top. Yeah, I like that. I, again, like really leaning into the asymmetrical nature of this game that we are designing right now and using the bluff, bluff, slash knowledge for uh, a negotiating power. Uh, and I think Bobacus, you had mentioned earlier, uh, Bobacus or Exonius, one of you had mentioned that, like, what is the value of the stocks? Like, what do I get for giving up one of these stocks? And knowledge, you know, knowledge is a great thing that you can trade off of uh, so if you know certain things about the future state of the game, then you can show the card to someone. Like, show you see the card, you choose who else to go. So you can kind of make these deals based on that, the, the knowledge. <laughs> Money is used to fill... <laughs> Money is used to fill all trackers. All trackers come back to money in the end, right? Bobacus, but we still don't have the asymmetry. How do you become the R&D person rather than the marketing or networking person. That's a good point. Um, this is a, an important part of the original challenge that was issued for having a really core asymmetry. And I think for that, again, for the food chain magnet thing, uh, so we have our different decks of cards and then you get uh, your buffs. And for the buffs thing, I think just going straight food chain magnet here. So if you're the first person to do the product action, or if you do product action X times, so there's certain cards, face-up cards that you'll be able to earn 
based on how many times you do the action or if you're the first person to do that action. And then every time you do something related to that action, you get a benefit or it's a little cheaper. So if you're the first person to code or whatever, then every time in the future you do that, like you can code more stuff or you can code faster, that kind of thing. And other people can take that action, it's just not gonna be as efficient for them. Efficient. <laughs> it's in your bow, event card, other company with similar product first to market. Ugh. You're really talking about heartbreak here, Senor Bob. Uh, other company beats you to market. That's like the death now. That's like the saddest thing that can happen to something as a startup. Babakus says, what if you draw two cards a turn and play one, but switching the piles you draw from costs and action? Yeah, that's, that's a nice... Uh, that's a simple, elegant playing option thing. And again, like we're talking about having hands and reorganizing, like I, it's just super simple. I want this like, my vision for this is to be a very tight, elegant game and just like draw two, play one. Like that's a very nice, juicy sort of gameplay to it. <laughs> Senor Bob, a lot of this smacks of my day job. Yay. That's a good thing for game design, right? When it feels like the thing that we're trying to copy. Bobakit says, and if you really want to focus on production, you can draw two production cards to draw the best cards. Hmm. Draw two cards. Or maybe you choose a deck you draw two from and another deck you draw one from and play. Not feeling buffs. Okay. I mean, it was, like, it felt really good in Food Chain Magnet. I will say... Definitely something that I think is up for play testing. I, I like where your head's at though with the more elegant, streamlined uh, sort of a thing. Instead of the buffs. Like it is, it's something you always have to check. It's a card that's out. You need um, fractional valuations of things usually to make it make sense if there's not enough granularity and then putting the granularity in there the numbers become more complicated so um yeah yeah i like definitely have to play around with that but uh you're you're you have some good points here bobkiss exonia says how apple went from good tech to good marketing because the ceo doesn't know what the tech does anymore <laughs> i like that it is a good point you know and you can win on both right like you can win on your valuation can go up because you market really well or because your products do very well. Like it's very uh, cutting analysis of the tech sector. Bobby says that it would represent switching your, switching your specialties. Um, Yeah. I would say the asymmetry comes from more efficiency. I can't spell today. More effic efficiency. <laughs> efficiency when going deep versus going broad. You take more cards or see more cards if you're going into one deck. If you want to pick from a couple of decks to hedge your bets. So if you're not 
going into this kind of asymmetrical dive deep sort of a thing, uh, you're going to get less control and less flexibility. So you have flexibility in one term where you're kind of seeing, uh, playing the board, like waiting for any sort of option to come up. But if you go really go deep into, if you specialize, um, more card advantage, we'll say for now, from specializing in one deck at a time. Maybe it stacks over turns. Again, exactly how that happens. Could be a little tricky to track, but you could definitely play around with something there. Zoni says, how would you show a 10 year effect in just a few turns. Um, well, I think that, yeah, for, for a lot of this, it's gonna be uh, like the beginning of a startup, like before IPO, it's not gonna be the whole life cycle of the startup. I think it's gonna be like the earlier stages. Research goals for five turns, crunch card but lowers morale you need to develop before the next financial season yeah crunch i think is a very interesting thing to represent here uh definitely i think there's a lot of con conversation in the industry about babaka says this makes things crunchier but you could buy employees and they always draw you cards from a certain pile or allow you to play more cards this turn employees being a tradable resource. <sighs> Buy employees. Yeah, and you had said, Babakis, about being like the vice president of the thing, so... <laughs> resource each uh, specialization has its own employees. Um, and you, you said buy employees, but recruit to your team or develop your team. So you kind of de facto become the head of engineering, for example, or maybe even get that title and direct them and you could be more like a CEO, a CTO, but playing around with, I see some asymmetry potentially coming there. Sony says you get into things like the shareholder are unhappy, we need to show that we have product. <laughs> I mean, just like all this flavor here is so perfect and so beautiful. Because that is just such a fun thing to play around with, right? Um, and that could be an event coming up, uh, or it could be something in the fundraising. So maybe in the decks there aren't even all good things, or all powerful things. Maybe there's, uh, and that's why you could have more flexibility for going into deeper into a certain deck. So this stuff comes up as bad, and you have to play a card. The stuff in the specialization dex is bad, needs to be mitigated, you have to play cards. <laughs> Either good development that you have a product or marketing as selling a bad product better. Um, yeah, you're a cat. Valuation could be uh, based on either good product or good marketing. Like I like both of these things being a factor of that because that is a core thing. You know, either you just you're putting very good spin on the stuff that you do have, or you just have things that are good enough that people are organically grassroots talking about your products. Actually, owning and trading employees doesn't do anything by itself. Owning an employee raises your salary paid in other companies' stock. 
<laughs> yeah, I like this idea of stock payments. Again, it's starting to get, like, there's a lot of stuff going on, but I want to play around with all these different ideas and see where it can come down. So either promise a higher pay, better working conditions, or blackmail them to switch teams. Oh my gosh, sniping people's employees from other people. If they were on tiers, like worker. Yeah, I like the all the different things that you can do here for the, the modifications of the employees. Of course, then that conflicts with the other company changing in valuation that don't want to introduce money. Yeah, I, I, I like the money tracker. Like there's, I like money in games, I think you can do a lot of stuff. I love playing around with this idea of simplification, like seeing how elegant we can get for combining all these different things. Whew, I can't believe it's been two hours already. This is so fun. You have all been amazing at adding together these ideas here. So much stuff going on. As always, if you're new to my stream um, or if you're returning, I like to emphasize these ideas belong to all of us. No one, I, no one owns anything that's coming up here. Um, I, one of the things I love about the board game industry is someone can have an idea, riff off of it. If any of us develop the game ideas that came out of this, they're going to be completely different things. So feel free to riff off these ideas. If it inspires you for something you're working on, that's awesome. That's great. I love to hear what people are working on. Can always hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Emma Larkins. Love having conversations over there. I'm also streaming board game design here every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, thinking about origins coming up. Um, I think I'll still be here on Tuesday. Or I might be traveling on Tuesday. There might be some travel coming up, but usually I'm on or I try and do an IRL stream or something to make up for a missed stream. Also usually here on Fridays, doing more casual game related stuff. Um, I believe my husband's gonna be jumping on to D&D here in a second, so I better pop off and let him do his D&D stuff. Uh, yeah, all the ideas here have been super, super cool. I'm looking forward to prototyping and developing these ideas. Uh, I have a lot of different games that I'm working on at the time, so not necessarily timelines for when these will become real things, but definitely look forward in the future at events to seeing these become reality, and I would super love to be able to play test either these ideas or other things with all of you to help me. <laughs> Senior Bob, oh, I'm totally keeping the fill. Your trackers with money idea in my back pocket. I, I think so much of the stuff we came up with during this stream is um, good mechanics, good tactics. Like take and use these pieces. The trackers bit I think is really cool. Uh, the stock pool, the employees, um, the heavy negotia negotiation element. I think there's a lot of good stuff there. Also, as far as the stream goes, Feel free to give us a follow if you want to stay abreast of when we're coming on again. I have my regular stream schedule here, but sometimes do additional streams as well. So following is a great opportunity to stay in touch with when we're doing the streams. You can also su subscribe. I am an affiliate now, so I have that option. If you're a Twitch Prime member, you actually get a free monthly subscription that you can use on Twitch uh, if you're on Amazon Prime, which is Twitch Prime, which is super cool and fun way to support the channel. So as always, I've had a blast doing this. I really appreciate you all tuning in and yeah, tune in again next week for more streaming. I will see you all around the table. Do